everyone. Uh, my name is Kaja Širok. I am from the National Museum of Contemporary History in Ljubljana, Slovenia. And I would like to welcome you all to the fifth webinar of the Identity on the Line uh, project. This is a four year project financed by the U EU program Creative uh, Europe. So for the newcomers, uh, just a few words about the project itself. The main coordinator is the West Eger Museum in Norway. And the Identity on the Line is a large scale cooperation project between six cultural history museums and one university. We are working together to explore the long-term consequences of different migration processes, forced or voluntary, which took place in Europe in the last hundred years. Through the collection and dissemination of experiences from former uh, migrants um, and their children and grandchildren, we are collecting stories. We are building narratives in order to present and transmit common features of migration from the past to the, um, to the future generation. So the priority of this project is to reinforce the sense of belonging to the common European space, um, to contemporary migrants, to those who have settled and their hosting communities. I would say that the project is discussing us and our roots. It's um, trying to build a participative and engaged narrative of complex historical events and shared collective memories on the basis of migration and identity building. And I'm really, really happy and honored that today we will discuss these important topics with Professor Peter Gatrell, who teaches, hi Peter, thank you and welcome, who teaches modern history at the University of Manchester, uh, where he's also affiliated to the Humanitarian and Conflict Response Institute. So Peter's main research topic is population displacement in the modern world, and he wrote many books. Uh, I'm going to show you some of them because I'm a great fan of uh, Peter's work. And his publications include a trilogy of refugee history. Um, yeah, you, you will see it vice versa, but these are just some of the books uh, Peter uh, wrote. In the first part of his academic career, he was mainly researching the economic and social history of Russia. Right now, his current research activity is devoted to the history of Europe, um, since 1945, with a focus on migration in and to Europe. Peter has directed several research projects on population displacement, state building, and social identity in the aftermath of the two world wars. In July 2018, uh, he started a three-year collaborative research project founded by the UK Arts and Humanitarian Research Council entitled Reckoning with Refugium, Refugee Voices in the Modern European uh, History. And this is Peter's last uh, book. So Peter, thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. Uh, and we are really, really waiting uh, for your webinar to start. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kaya. And I'm very pleased to join you in this discussion. Uh, I'm going to share a screen because I have a few slides that I want to use as the basis for my talk today. So I hope you can see <clears throat> the slides. Um, as Kaya said, this is part of a, a broad research project that we've entitled Reckoning with Refugeedom, Refugee Voices in Modern History. And I'm going to say a little bit more uh, about that project um, but also use this opportunity to draw upon some of my own particular archival research to try and illuminate um, the ways in which refugees made their voices heard in the period between uh, the end of the Second World War and the middle years of the 1970s. So <clears throat> just to give you a bit of introduction to the project as a whole, um, you'll see that there's this unfamiliar word refugeedom, um, which is actually a word that was coined uh, in Russia during the First World War. Um, and the reason I like it very much is that it gives us an opportunity to go beyond the familiar 
concept of a refugee regime, which is familiar to political science uh, and other disciplines. <clears throat> uh, a refugee regime which can be regarded as a, a, as a system of rules and norms and so forth, in which a series of powerful actors are involved, and the actors may be states, they may be intergovernmental organisations like the League of Nations or uh, in more recent years, UNHCR, uh, and non-governmental organizations as well. <clears throat> but I think in using the term refugeedom, what we're trying to do is to put much more into the center of the story uh, refugees themselves and how they make their voices heard, what experiences they recount, <clears throat> what perspectives they've adopted, uh, what status or changes in status have taken place as a result of displacement. And, and fundamentally, this is an opportunity to ask questions about uh, who is speaking, uh, either refugees themselves or on behalf of refugees, to whom are they addressing themselves? What are the circumstances in, in which they speak? And what terms or conditions are influencing the ways in which they speak uh, and finally what kind of tone do they adopt. So we might want to discuss in the in the Q&A uh, the whole question of, of refugee voices but uh, what we're trying to do here is to reflect on historical material since obviously uh, it's impossible to conduct uh, interviews of, of people who are no longer alive. The project as a whole is comparative and historically contextualized. So uh, because it's a team project, we have other people working on, for example, uh, South Asia, uh, on the Middle East, uh, as well as Europe in the interwar period as well. So it's not just a European focus, although most of what I shall be doing this morning is talking uh, about uh, Europe. <clears throat> and I'm particularly interested in the period of the uh, third quarter of the 20th century, which is the period <clears throat> encompassed by the, the origins of this big new organization, the United Nations High Commission for Refugees, UNHCR, uh, <clears throat> until 1975, uh, when it changed its system of, of archiving and, and cataloging. <clears throat> it's important, however, to remember that if we're thinking of the refugees who were protected or assisted by UNHCR, that the organization operated according to a, a mandate, a UN mandate, which <clears throat> prescribed uh, those refugees uh, wh whom it should uh, be interested in. And of course, there were <clears throat> millions of refugees around the world who at this stage uh, didn't fall within the uh, remit or the compass of UNHCR. So in other words, the, the material that I'm looking at uh, is really quite partial in terms of time uh, uh, and place. Nevertheless, as my title suggests, <clears throat> I want to argue that this material is itself extensive uh, and very rich. These are the uh, confidential case files of individuals that were collected by UNHCR between 1951 and 19. 75. So let, let me begin <clears throat> with a little bit of background before introducing you to some of the voices, as it were, of, of refugees themselves. So this is a, a bureaucratic <clears throat> organization, a powerful one, um, not quite as powerful it, in the early period uh, as we might think. Uh, it was an institutional newcomer on the scene. Um, <clears throat> there had of course been predecessor organizations uh, between the wars, the office of the League of Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, founded in the early 1920s and headed by the famous Norwegian explorer Fridtjof Nansen. And more recently, since the uh, Second World War in, in 1946-47, there was an international refugee organization <clears throat> whose primary purpose was to uh, support resettlement of, of refugees uh, from Europe to other parts of the world. 
1950, 51, the United Nations agreed to establish an office of the High Commissioner uh, of Refugees. And he had a small office in Geneva. I mean, we're talking about an office with no more than a few dozen individuals and a few branch offices, mainly at this stage uh, in Europe, in Italy, Germany, uh, and so on. It's important also to understand that the whole apparatus was governed in the first instance by the United Nations Refugee Convention, which had been signed by a number of signatory states in 1951 and laid down definitions as to who was and who was not uh, a refugee. What that meant was that part of the apparatus was one in which UNHCR employed a number of so-called eligibility officers, and it was their job to assess claims that individuals might make for recognition as a refugee under the convention uh, on the grounds primarily of, of their persecution. And that then led to uh, an effort to collect, to process uh, the applications that came the way of the uh, UNHCR office in Geneva. And the, the outcome now is that the archives, the records and archives in Geneva in its large basement holds something like 23,000 individual case files. Um, these are confidential, uh, they're not available uh, to, to members of the public or, or to researchers, but I've been given um, access to them uh, on the basis that I can use them but not identify individuals by name. This is, a, as you can imagine, a very rich source for the historian covering uh, a quarter of a century of, in effect, world history. And the material consists of um, letters and, part and petitions uh, in which refugees are approaching uh, the office or some of the branch offices, and they might be asking a whole number of different questions. Uh, obviously, in the wake of the Second World War, there were many questions about trying to trace family members who had disappeared from view. Um, and those um, requests might well be transferred to another office, such as the International Tracing Service or the Red Cross. Or there might be requests for family reunion, for example, people who'd left a communist Eastern Europe in the 1940s might then try to uh, persuade those authorities to uh, enable them to be reunited with family members who were still in their country of origin. Or they might request for, for financial help of one sort or another to move from poor accommodation to a better place of, of living uh, or compensation for property that had been lost in some way or, or other. Students often figure in these files, uh, not just from Europe, but for example, from Sub-Saharan Africa in the 1960s and 1970s, uh, asking for travel documents or student bursaries and that kind of thing. And all of these different multiple requests uh, often involved discussions between UNHCR and what at the time were called VOLAGs or voluntary agencies, organizations that we'd now call non-governmental organizations. So you can imagine a kind of file that might be just a, a, a page or two, but might run to dozens or even hundreds of pages of correspondence to and fro between UNHCR, different offices, uh, non-governmental organizations, as well as refugees themselves. As far as the, the format of these files is concerned, um, they will sometimes include a short uh, statement or request written by uh, a refugee him or herself, sometimes collectively by several refugees, sometimes handwritten, uh, sometimes typewritten uh, in different languages. I mean, probably a dozen or more languages uh, of which I can read a few. Uh, even as Esperanto, there's a, a nice file that I've come across 
in which someone says, well, I'm a specialist in Esperanto and I know fellow uh, enthusiasts for Esperanto um, and the UNHCR then had to get it translated from Esperanto into uh, English or, or French. These exchanges, in, in other words, these files can sometimes spread over uh, years, sometimes even for one or two decades. Uh, they're mainly um, letters um, and, and such like texts other than uh, photographs. You don't get much in the way of photographic material um, unless it's a kind of standardized form of resettlement in, in which the, the form has a passport photograph of, of the individual or his or her family members. So unfortunately the, the kind of material that's, that's in these files uh, is usually fairly standardized and you don't find too many surprises in terms of, of photographs. Occasionally you'll find greetings cards in which refugees say thank you very much for the help that they've received. <clears throat> the records are not entirely about refugees of European origin, um, although a good number of them are. <clears throat> what that means is that um, amongst the the kind of files that you might expect to find, such as refugees from Hungary or Romania or Poland and so forth, um, you also find a large number of case files that go back to the First World War. Um, for example, elderly Russian refugees who've ended up in, in China and are still there in the 1950s, for example, uh, and who might want to uh, resettle uh, in Western Europe or Australia or, or Latin America. So there's a lot of material uh, that is of a particular uh, kind and, and origin, um, but it does nevertheless mean that you find correspondence from, uh, from Latin America or, or Australia uh, about refugees or, or their family members. A lot of the documentation were <coughs> Um, issues around identification. Is this person who he or she says they are? Um, is this person eligible under UNHCR uh, auspices? <clears throat> For example, uh, as you may well know, uh, amongst the millions of people who were expelled as being of ethnic German origin from countries such as Poland and Czechoslovakia, uh, they were not deemed eligible uh, under the uh, under the convention of 1951. So they were left to their own devices or to the devices of, of, of German states. So UNHCR eligibility officers were trying to work out uh, who is eligible uh, and who is not. But they kept all these files, not just because they knew that, that I was gonna be interested in them 50 or 60 or 70 years later, um, but because they were interested in, in creating their own archival record um, and working out whether case A might set a precedent for case B, C or D and so forth. Unfortunately, um, th and this is very tantalizing, um, but if you've done historical research, you'll be well uh, aware of this, um, there are gaps and, and certainly the outcomes of many of these cases uh, is, is often unclear. And before I just share with you a small number of, of case studies. I, I want to make the point that it's not my purpose to claim that uh, I've got a representative sample. I, I find it very difficult to think what that representative sample might look like. Um, but I do think it's important to reinforce the point that this does provide us with an important and valuable way of illuminating the ways in which individual refugees spoke about their displacement and how they engaged with this powerful body, um, the UNHCR. So just to share with you uh, a few fragments from the uh, archive. Uh, here we have the case of uh, a man called Eli H, uh, born in Romania in 1924 who by the early 1950s is writing to UNHCR from Davos in Switzerland. And I give you this 
fragment uh, because it makes a fairly obvious point that with the Cold War, uh, many refugees from Eastern Europe were reinforcing the message that, as you can see from this slide, we want to be resettled far from the communist danger. Nothing particularly surprising in that, perhaps, and the expansion and so on and so forth. It's tapping into a, a kind of well of Cold War rhetoric. But what was interesting to me when I read this is that Ellie uses the phrase help for our rehabilitation. And by using this word, he was alluding to a whole discourse of, of rehabilitation that was circulating right around the globe, uh, not just in Europe, but in the Middle East uh, and in uh, the Indian subcontinent as well, about trying to transform uh, the situation of, of refugees, it, indeed even transform um, psyche of, of refugees uh, in which they would be uh, allowed to entertain the hope of, of a better future. It's also important that to Ellie that he wanted to tell UNHCR that we shall not cease with our efforts. In other words, this is insisting upon their kind of capacity not to go away, but to keep fighting, as it were, uh, for, for freedom. We're demanding, in other words, free peoples and their governments to assist. Demonstrate your readiness to rescue us. So it's the language of, of rescue and rehabilitation that's infusing this particular uh, passage from uh, a Romanian refugee. But alongside that, uh, and again, perhaps not altogether surprising assertiveness, um, what you sometimes find in these files is the voice of, of supplication of someone who is approaching UNHCR in order to appeal for their assistance from a position of, as it were, subordination rather than any kind of power. But in this case, this is a, a Czech refugee <clears throat> in the late 1950s who is in Bolivia. Um, and, and what I find striking about this is not only the voice of the supplicant, of the petitioner, um, who ends his, uh, his letter, uh, as you can see, by saying, once more, I put my fate in your fatherly hands. In other words, it's you uh, and only you who can help me. Um, but uh, what is interesting is that Fred, this refugee, is creating a kind of link or a rapport with this official because he says at the beginning, I had the possibility to see in your personality a person who is treating with all the heart people in need like a father and in view. <clears throat> in other words, it was important to this person that he should create a kind of bond or relationship between himself as a supplicant and uh, an official who he thought had the possibility of assisting him. Um, in the end, unfortunately for Fred, UNHCR said, we can't do anything to help you. If you don't like the, uh, the atmosphere in La Paz, in Bolivia, then maybe you can try other cities in Bolivia uh, instead. But I'm less interested in the actual outcome as the tone of Fred's appeal to UNHCR. Once more, I put my fate in your fatherly hands. So, you know, thinking about this institution, not as kind of something very abstract and impersonal, but as something uh, which is operated by, uh, by human beings who are being appealed to for help. This one, uh, I, I apologize uh, for, for those who, who may not know French, but I wanted to keep it in, in the original French because it is such a lyrical uh, account by uh, somebody called Lubitsa, a female born in Italy, who's writing in the early 1960s and who has a, a difficult story to tell about having been forced out of um, Italy uh, under the Mussolini racial laws, then finds herself imprisoned by the Nazis. Um, <clears throat> and eventually uh, she and her husband make their way to Canada. But at the time she is providing, it's part of her documentation, what I regard as a very lyrical 
account of escape and and refuge. She's talking about uh, the um, town uh, on the French Italian border, Ventimiglia. But what's more important to her is to is to paint a very dramatic story of of her flight uh, in a in a in a boat in Bach, surchargé, so filled with refugees, um, and getting on this boat, which is at risk of being uh, of capsizing. Uh, and it, you know, of course, you won't be surprised to, to understand how this resonated with the reader. You know, in, in 2019, when I when I first read it, uh, in relation to what was happening in in the Mediterranean uh, in very recent years, but this is a very powerful and and carefully composed account where she wants to talk about the the boat journeys and the and the threat of capsizing, but also when she gets onto onto dry land, how there are mountain passes that were difficult to to negotiate. So I've, I've ended up, she says, in France, uh, in, in Nice, but I'm tired and, and, and hungry, physically and, and mentally or morally uh, disturbed. But very, very rewarding to, to read this kind of very insistent and dramatic account in which she's, she's painting a picture uh, for uh, UNHCR and trying to dramatize it using the words at her command. Then, as another example that stood out to me uh, of someone, a Bulgarian, Zhivko, who eventually was able to get uh, from Bulgaria via Italy to, to Sweden. Unfortunately for, unfortunately for Zhivko, uh, he's writing because he's in prison uh, and he's in prison in uh, Vexho in Sweden. And he wants to explain to UNHCR what has got him into this, this difficulty. And so he confesses, he confesses. And I haven't changed the, the English. He's writing in English. Uh, in August, I've taken a car. I don't know whose car it was. Uh, he doesn't have a driver's license. And yet more, I was drunk. <coughs> It's all my pity, but I'm very afraid. So he's he's saying you know, he's confessing um, that he did something bad. It's his own fault. And ne but nevertheless, it's got him into into a dangerous situation. I'm very afraid. Um, he's, he's reminding the High Commissioner that he has status. I'm a political immigrant. And I've got this paper from your commissioner. So please don't tell me to get lost. And I have a, I have status. But. If, if Sweden uh, sends me back to Sofia, it's my death. I mustn't be sent back to my country and you know why. And then he ends by saying, I suppose you can help me if you want to do it. I'd be no end grateful. <clears throat> so you have this, this poor man who is really at his wits end because he's afraid of the consequences of being returned to uh, Bulgaria. Um, and UNHCR uh, replies <coughs> indirectly by trying to insist to the Swedish government or the Swedish labour market board that they shouldn't deport him to Bulgaria at the end of his sentence. And unfortunately, I don't know what the outcome was. Uh, I presume that Sweden managed to see its way to uh, holding on to him rather than to deporting him to, to Bulgaria. But it's the kind of personal appeal and, and the lament uh, and the confessional element that struck me as being particularly significant here. <clears throat> then I, I wanted to share this slide with you because this is from a Serbian journalist, Borovoyo, uh, writing in the late 1950s, uh, again in French. Um, <clears throat> And what I really like about this statement is that it's someone who is um, clearly um, from other sources in the, in, in the file uh, in a desperate situation. But the way he approaches UNHCR is to say, uh, I'm, I'm not writing you simply because I like paper. 
you know, and I and I, I I'm I'm not simply writing in order to get more uh, handwriting uh, or, or autographs to put in my autograph book. Um, I just want a quiet life. Je n'aspire qu'un vie calme. Um, and and. Also, it's it's uncomfortable for me to speak about myself. Je n'aime surtout pas parler de moi-même. Um, but I'm writing because I've got no other option. You you are the you are the boss. You are the head of an institution, um, and it's it's my view that uh, that your intervention is the only way of supporting me and getting me out of my difficult situation. Um, but I'm interested here, not, not in the particularity of the case, but in the kind of wit that some refugees deploy in approaching UNHCR. Of course, you can also find evidence where it's not so much wit, but refugees who use the petition or the letter as a way of talking back at UNHCR. And the best example uh, I, I can find of this comes from an entirely different context, which is that of Ethiopia, where there are many files in which refugees from other parts of, of Africa, in this case, Sudan, have ended up in the late 1960s. And this guy, Malat or Malaf K, um, is writing to the current, or the then High Commissioner, Prince Sadruddin Ali Khan in 1970. So he's writing from Addis Ababa. And basically he's complaining that they've had a visit from UNHCR in Addis Ababa, um, but nothing really has happened uh, as a result of this, of this activity. And I've put in, in red the, the hard hitting nature in which this Sudanese individual is describing what he regards as the incompetence or malevolence of UNHCR officials. In other words, so he's not prepared to be fobbed off. He's not prepared to be told, oh, there's nothing more we can do. You know, he's actually making an accusation against uh, UNHCR, uh, particularly in, in Ethiopia. But he then goes on to say, this also reflects upon the UNHCR administration in Geneva, whose duty it is to control its regional office. So there's something <clears throat> very striking about the tone and the content of this particular file in, in which he's even going so far as to talk about not just incompetence, but a lack of integrity on the part of UNHCR officials. And he also ends by saying, you, your highness, you scrupulously avoided all contact with refugees. So it's a very bitter denunciation, really, of UNHCR's uh, views and approaches towards him and his fellow refugees from Sudan. And then finally, um, <clears throat> another slide from another file. Uh, we're back in, in Europe. This is uh, uh, Josef K., a Hungarian refugee, <coughs> writing in the later 1960s, again to Sadrudin, the then High Commissioner for Refugees. Um, and you can see, <coughs> again, this refugee is addressing the High Commissioner in person. Um, I haven't changed the, uh, the spelling. <coughs> Pardon me for taking the liberty to write I know that you being a prince and a high commissioner have many problems and would hardly bother about the problems of a mere refugee. I have little hope that you shall read my letter. <clears throat> and then he goes on to say, you know, nothing has happened. For a long time, I have tried to get help from the people in the refugee's office, but have failed. <clears throat> um, he is writing from a, a place in, in Turkey, in Ankara. And he's complaining about a man called Schindler, who's the UNHCR representative. These people, he says, have no heart or conscience. <clears throat> um, and he goes on to say that Mr. Schindler, so he identifies the, the official by name, is a big man. Why should he be concerned with the problems of a little man like me? He is a busy man and has important duties like cocktails and social gatherings and parties. Anyway, I trusted Mr. Schindler, because he has a manner of speech which inspires confidence at first. Anyway, I was fooled. <clears throat> so 
again, I really like this uh, indication from the case files of someone who is who is writing not purely from a place of abjection and, and misery, um, but is clearly unhappy and uncertain about his, his status uh, and is taking the opportunity to use sarcasm as what James Scott, the sociologist, would, would call a weapon of the weak to try and get his, his voice heard. And the outcome was that uh, he did manage to get himself resettled in Switzerland and Geneva office sent a, a note to Schindler in Turkey telling him to, to raise his game. So finally, with some reflections, to make the obvious point, these are people who are uh, no longer alive. Well, a few of them are, um, but we certainly can't interview uh, refugees at this distance in time. But the case files, for all their bureaucratic purpose, give us some sort of sense as to who refugees were and, and what they were saying in, in past times. There's a multiplicity of voices and, and outcomes um, that becomes clear from the files. Um, refugees were sometimes being dismissed as difficult people you know, because they kept coming back to the office for more and more uh, requests for help. Some of them were dismissed as mental cases. I haven't spoken about that, but there were significant numbers who were who were set aside as 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 on on the grounds that they was they had uh, a mental illness. Some of them obviously did. Uh, not all of them, I fear, uh, but all of them were caught in what I would describe as a web of power relations that was spun by UNHCR and other organisations such as NGOs. UNHCR was having to confront the politics, the consequences of displacement, whether it's war, including the First World War, revolution, whether it's Russia, whether it's communist revolution in Eastern Europe, whether it's revolution in China in 1949, and also decolonization, uh, particularly in Africa. And UNHCR gradually extended its reach. So the way I think of UNHCR, it's a work in progress and the work in progress emerges from these from these files. The case files are part of a learning process. Finally, we've got a, an opportunity to, to confront and reflect upon questions of access. And that's a very difficult term. I'm thinking here of, of my access to the archives and how it's conditional and privileged and how that compares to the access of refugees to the office uh, then and now. Uh, I feel as a historian a sense of intrusion, uh, intruding upon people's lives, intruding upon people's difficulties and, and grief very often. Lastly, these files are, are fragments. Uh, they're not a complete life story. They're, they're simply what's being told by refugees in order to get assistance or protection. But nevertheless, though they're fragmentary, I also think that their content and their tone can shine a spotlight on, on what we call the matrix of refugeedom. So I'm finishing there and thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, thank you for this inspiring um, lecture. Uh, it's time for questions, but before we start, just two important informations that I forgot to tell them uh, uh, before. So first, you already saw that we are recording and actually all the webinars will be available um, at the web page of the project, so identity on the line, eon.museum. Uh, and the second thing, very important also, um, pay attention at the end when you are going to lock out, there is going to be a survey, please do the survey, we need it in order to complete uh, our project. And now it's time for questions. Uh, I realize that there are many historians, scholars who are listening to the, to the webinar. So you are kindly invited to ask questions. Um, I will start with the first one, of course, as always, I have many questions. But my first one is, um, you said that there are 23,000 um, in uh, records, uh, individual stories in the record and archive in Geneva. Uh, and that they are not available for the public or for the for historians to look at. So when do you think that they will be available for researchers 
are there going to be one day or not? Okay, the, the, the answer to this question is that um, the project uh, was able to support UNHCR records and archives in creating a spreadsheet of uh, the files that, that all, all that ha had happened in the past was that the files existed in physical form in, in binders in, in the basement of, of UNHCR. There was no, there was no formal catalog of, of what these uh, files were. So there is now a spreadsheet and the spreadsheet identifies uh, individuals uh, by name uh, and where possible uh, country of origin uh, and the place from which the file was being generated. So it might be generated in Vienna or it might be generated in, in Addis Ababa and so on. Um, uh, UNHCR is always very, very concerned about issues of, of confidentiality. So if you work on, for example, more recent periods, a lot of people are interested in what's happening in former Yugoslavia in the 1990s. There's an enormous quantity of material that's there already and keeps coming in to Geneva from different parts of, of Europe. Um, but UNHCR regards its main mission uh, as supporting uh, its own operations and supporting refugees in, in situ, you know, current refugees. Um, so there are issues around um, the, the, the time at which confidential case files can be opened. And I don't think that will happen for, you know, for many, many years. Uh, it's possible that individual scholars will be able to, to, to access this material. Um, but UNHCR has to tread very, very carefully because um, uh, so, some, some people are still alive who, who figure in these files. And there are certainly descendants who, who, who are alive. Um, occasionally something very um, strange, if you like, happens, which is that you'll find in the file a newspaper report. Uh, in other words, the, the individual concerned has come to the attention of a, of a, a government official or, or, or a, a member of parliament or a journalist, uh, and so you'll find the confidential file includes something that's in the public domain, a newspaper report or a, or, or, or a magazine or something. But again, one has to be very, very careful not to uh, identify the individual. So I'm, I'm kind of governed by those rules. Okay. Um, so we have a question. Yeah. So Ivalo is asking that, can you talk about the difficulties uh, of the ones in the mental cases? Are the people cases uh, discussing uh, the mental cases because of the war? And how did they or you deal with that? Okay, um, thank you for that question. Um, there, there are a number of files uh, in which there is content, in other words, a letter or a petition, so on. Uh, but the outcome, either initially or after several kind of rounds of correspondence, is, is that the office says at the end, uh, mental case, no action. Mental case in inverted commas, no action. Um, I, I'm not professionally uh, qualified to, to judge, um, and I'm reflecting on the ways in which officers um, reacted. Some, sometimes, uh, from, from a non-professional point of view, uh, I, I could easily see how they might come to that conclusion uh, because uh, there are cases in which individuals go on at, at great length uh, ab about, um, for example, being uh, bombarded by gamma rays uh, in, in hospital. You know, some, somebody re reports that they've been hospitalized and that they've been receiving some sort of treatment which they've interpreted as, as being um, you know, completely uh, fantastical. Um, but then of course you then read between the lines and you say, well, maybe what they describe as some kind of, uh, uh, of outlandish treatment is what at the time was conventional treatment like as you know, um, um, electric shock treatment. Um, so you end up feeling that there are, there are cases in which uh, 
UNHCR has very quickly reached the conclusion that somebody is mentally ill, but that you think that there's a lot more to it than that. Occasionally you will find files in which refugees write letter after letter after letter uh, uh, in, in you know, green ink. And, uh, and that seems to be a way of UNHCR to immediately think this person is mad, we're not gonna take it any further. But then, you know, to go back to, to your question, of course, I, I know the word is often used, but there is trauma here. And um, there are people who are traumatized uh, either by years they've spent as forced laborers or years they've spent in a concentration camp, or indeed years they've spent in a DP camp in, in the late 40s and the 1950s. So I think uh, I, I don't take the word or the description mental case at face value. Uh, I'm prepared to accept that in, in some instances, this, this person clearly is, uh, you know, deranged or deeply disturbed, but I'm also interested in trying to understand why that's the case. Just one other um, kind of reference. Um, you, you may not be surprised to learn that there, in, in these instances, officials sometimes say this person is, is hysterical. And it, you won't be surprised to learn that that usually means a woman is being described as hysterical. And then when you read the file, you realize that hysteria is perfectly understandable in relation to what that person is going through. And to dismiss it as hysterical is, is really a, a, a sign that that official has a problem <laughs> rather than the person concerned. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask another thing, which was that you said that uh, a part of our research is done in Europe and there is a part in Southeast Asia and in the Middle East. So uh, when we are discussing uh, the dissolution of the big empires and the decolonization period, uh, what kind of letters uh, can we came across? Because basically I think that there were many people who were originally from Europe who were living in the colonies and actually they had a lot of problems coming back to Europe. I recently read the book of Pamela Bellinger about the decolonization of Italy. Mm -hmm. um, she's going to be our, uh, we are going to host her in, in the next two weeks. And she said, you know, right now we are discussing people from Libya migrating to Europe, but actually after the Second World War, uh, the people in Libya were the Italians who wanted to migrate back, back to Italy. And the history is repeating in a completely different level. So did you came across any letters of people from Europe who wanted to come back to, uh, to Europe and they were living in the colonies? Yes, um, there, there are, um, I don't know how many, I've certainly, I've certainly read uh, a number of files in which there are these complex trajectories where someone has left, it might be Russia or uh, other countries in East and Central Europe uh, and have ended up in other parts of the world. It might be South America, it might be um, in North Africa. Um, <clears throat> so, sometimes these are people who've moved for, for business reasons um, and, and then find that they, um, they, they're, they're effectively stateless. Um, um, and but might want to return for kind of personal reasons um, or to recover property, for example. Um, there are lots of cases of, um, for example, refugee seamen who've who've been uh, traveling for, for decades and who find themselves in, in a situation of statelessness. There are people who've joined, for example, the French Foreign Legion uh, and then decide they've either had enough or have got into trouble and, and want to return. Um, I, I'm not sure I've come across any of the cases that Pam Ballinger uh, talks about, but you know, I strongly recommend people to tune in to her talk because she's written a wonderful book. Um, there are a, a number, as I've said, of um, elderly Russians who, who moved after 1917 to places like Harbin uh, and are still there. Uh, in the 1950s and uh, getting on in age uh, and, and really want to um, live out the last years of their life in situations of, of relative comfort. So they're asking about retiring to old age homes in Switzerland or France or 
uh, other parts of Western Europe. And, and UNHCR does its best to try and uh, accommodate those wishes. So there's a lot of activity from that point of view. But as I said at the beginning, Kaya, uh, you find in these files a kind of reflection of a, of a world of displacement. Uh, so the origins might be in, in Moscow or, or, or Prague, or, or, or Bucharest or wherever, but um, they, the, the, the ramifications can spread to, uh, to Venezuela or, or Australia or, 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 um, or the Middle East. Oh, okay, thank you. So we have the last question. Um, okay, the question goes that if you have any information about the Lithuanian refugees during that period, thank you. Um, I, I did actually do a, a, a search through through my notes, and uh, the answer, unfortunately, is not at the moment. Um, and uh, that's not to say there aren't any. I, I do know of, of of one instance, but it's only one amongst the hundreds that I've already looked at of of Lithuanian um, uh, kind of. I guess you'd you'd, you'd call them an, an elite family, not aristocratic, but part of the kind of intellectual and diplomatic elite. Um, but no, um, if if you're interested and, and want to contact me via Kaya, um, you know, privately, I can I can look through the spreadsheet and, and perhaps come up with an indication of how many there might be. But I think the answer is going to be disappointing. Not very many. OK, and now two questions pop. So uh, we will answer, if it's okay for you, we can an still answer two questions. Okay, yeah. the first one is a rather trivial question. This is how the, it was put. So could you elaborate a bit more on individuals that you came across whose experiences of refugee doom started already during in the First World War or in the uh, immediate post-war years? So we go 100 years ago. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. <clears throat> there, there are a great many files that I've looked at, which are which are very powerful, precisely because this this file was opened in let's say 1955 <clears throat> or 1960 even. Uh, but the person concerned was born in the 1890s, and they've experienced uh, war and displacement in in the Russian Empire, for example, um, and have, and and may well have been displaced multiple times. Uh, and I think that's that's awfully important that that you have pe people who are who are being described as elderly, and you realise they might be younger than I am. <laughs> Nevertheless, um, are being described as elderly by by UNHCR, and you realise just how much experience of displacement that they they have they have had. Um, so yes, the answer to your question is a, a great many cases that go back to the experience of the First World War in Russia and Eastern Europe. Um, as well, of course, to the um, to the 1920s, and then uh, you know, not not just Jewish refugees, but Spanish Civil War refugees will also emerge in the files and, and create some really interesting material as well. So, and the last question, uh, Miriam is asking, what would be a representative sample in research researching the refugee doom? Um, I've I've thought a great deal about this. I. I can't offer you an easy answer to the question of representativeness. Um, all, all I've done is uh, look through the, the spreadsheet um, and try to um, make sure that the files I'm reading give some kind of uh, coverage um, beyond what I might call the, um, the expected, to look at the unexpected. Um, you could, in principle, uh, begin to select what might be hundreds of, of cases of Hungarian refugees, Hungarian refugees from 1956, but also Hungarian refugees whose whose case was opened because they were they were uh, they'd left Hungary uh, after the First World War. Um, th they they are probably overrepresented in the files. Um, uh, but I'm, I'm not interested uh, in this project in trying to write the history of Hungarian refugees. Uh, I, I'm interested in trying to get a kind of cross section of experiences and accounts. That's all I'm really trying to do. It'll be for, for somebody with other skills 
um, and, and maybe eventually with things like digital humanities to try and you know, produce something uh, more sophisticated. Um, at, the, at the moment, I'm trying to make sure that I'm allowing the experiences and the voices of refugees who come from unexpected places, you know, ref refugees from um, Zanzibar who, who, who begin to show up in the 1960s. Uh, I want to make sure that they're not lost to the historian's view uh, when, you know, you could write endless accounts of, of Hungarian refugees very often who may be saying the same sorts of things, you know, using the rhetoric of the Cold War. Um, I, I, I don't want to dismiss that, but nor do I want to overlook the fact that there are other voices that uh, that may, may be very unusual, but because they're unusual and distinctive, I want to give them their due as well. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, it's all for today. Uh, thank you, Peter, again for everything, and especially for the last part, uh, which was also very inspiring. Um, to all of you, next week we will host Amina Krvavac. She is the executive director of the War Childhood Museum in Sarajevo. It's a great project. They started with a book and then uh, they built uh, themselves, they create a museum, and after the museum now they have already branches of the museum around Europe. Uh, a very important topic, very much connected to the topic that we discussed today. Uh, thank you all again. Thank you, Peter, and see you uh, next week. And don't forget to do the survey. Thank you so much. Bye. <laughs>